Second Chronicles chapter 6. After the uh, temple has been built, after the ark has been brought into the most holy place. Then said Solomon, now we, the, the cloud has appeared, verses 5, 13, and 14. They put the, the ark of the covenant in the house of the Lord, in the most holy place. Then this cloud drives everybody out, the presence of God. With that, then said Solomon, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. You say, well, God is light. What do you do when you look up at the solar system, when you look out into space in the middle of the night? All you see is darkness. And beyond that darkness, that, that crystal sea is God's throne. Some of the things written, like we're reading the book of Job as a family now. And Job says, well, does man live after death? I'm like, don't you know? No, they don't. Sometimes there's no revelation of man until Jesus shows up or into the, the books of the New Testament. But I have built an house for the habitation for thee and a place for thy dwelling forever. Uh, Solomon, this place is going to be destroyed. It's going to be rebuilt. It's going to be rebuilt and then it's going to be destroyed again. It's going to be rebuilt and the Antichrist is going to be in there. And then you're going to have the marvelous where Jesus Christ is going to go in the temple and the heavens and earth are going to fold away and burn up with fervent heat. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Sometimes people put too much stock in the building and not God. This is the same man is going to go worship every god and goddess under the sun. We look at the builders, but we don't look at God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has with it. Huh? Right? And the Lord and the king turned his face and blessed the whole congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. So he turned his face. What's he doing? He's looking at that cloud. He's looking at the priests. They can't. There's different, they can't go in there. There is the presence of God in the temple he just built. And he speaks, hey, God, you're wonderful. Then he turns around to the people who are standing behind him, now are in front of him. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has with his hands fulfilled that which he has spanked with my mouth to my father David, saying. Now here comes history. And it is reminded quite often when you deal with the Bible history. And we are in a day and age today where history is rewritten, history is erased, history has no value anymore. And you doom to fail when you don't know your history. Since the day that I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, Exodus, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in. There's no standard place yet. The, the Ark and the Covenant and the, the Tabernacle moved from place to place to place to place. That my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. They were not supposed to be a king. Supposed to be God as the king. But the people wanted a king like all the nations. But I have chosen Jerusalem, okay, now I've chosen it, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. What about Saul? He was wicked, died, went to hell. David was a man after God's heart. David was a man that truly repented of his sin. David was one that sought the Lord. David was the one that thought of God. So the city of David, Zion, Jerusalem, became that place God said, that's where my name's going to be. And right now you got the dumb of the rock and then you got religions, you got Catholics, you got all kinds of Baptists out. Oh, we're in the Holy City. Oh, and next week we'll go visit the Ark in Tennessee. Oh, you're foolish. You're absolutely foolish. It's the God. It's the name of God. My name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be ruler of my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem. That's the capital of the world in the eyes of God. That my name might be there and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart, that's where it is, 
For with the man with the heart man believes in righteousness of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord of God, Lord God of Israel. David looked out his window, looked out his palace one day, saw those curtains, and said, I'm dwelling in, in, in this nice furniture. I'm dealing with this nice cedar. I've got a lavish palace. And look at God down there. I mean, the wind is blowing that. It's a tent. And I'm dwelling in this. There's got to be something better for God. How dare I live above God? That's the heart of David. For as much as it was in thy heart to build a house for my name, thou didst well, and that it was in thy heart. So there are some things that we can do as Christians. We can think about it. We can do it with the heart. Oh, Lord, God. And then sometimes we can't do it for some reason. Now, I think that's where missionaries and evangelists come in by supporting them. I love the Jewish people, but I, I can't go over Israel and be missionaries to them. But I have found missionaries who do the work. There are places of situation that I would not ever go. I would not ever go to the Congo. Bad enough, I got enough snakes here in Florida. I haven't seen any, but I don't like snakes. I don't like animals that can bite and hurt you. And yet, we support a missionary in the Congo, places where I would like to go for the people, but I'm unable. The dark continent of Africa, yet to go and tell those people of Jesus Christ, I'm unable to go. I support someone there. Oh, the great history and the relevance of the Bible of Thessalonica. Well, there are missionaries there. My family who comes from Poland, my grandparents, both of them come straight over from Poland. Oh, the Polish land, there are missionaries there. Maybe some the time there, maybe some of my family was witness to. Sometimes in your heart, I mean, you really got a desire in your heart, but you're unable. We may find that to gold, silver, and precious stone at the judgment seat of Christ. Remember, it's our thoughts. It's our thoughts. And maybe we set, David set out. David couldn't build that, that temple, but he got the gold, he got the silver, he got the bread, he got everything. He didn't get enough, but still he gave into that work. That's a missionary work. And there's a proof right there for supporting missionaries that go out with the word of God to do something you can. And sometimes maybe you start something, you pray on God's and go, and whatever happens, that field closes or dies down or so. Your heart was in it. My heart was to start a work in Norwich, and Lord said, no, that's going somewhere else. My heart's to start a work down here in Daytona. I don't know. Hopefully the Lord will do it. But my heart is in there, and I've been doing what I believe what the Bible says to do, and am I going to get a void? Am I going to say, no, you don't get no reward? Thou didst well in that what is in thy heart, notwithstanding. Thou shalt not build a house, but thy son which shall come forth of thy loins. It's inside him. He shall build the house from my name. Now look, and the Lord before, therefore has performed. Wait a minute. Look how Solomon left out the fact is that David was a murderer. David shed blood in wartime. Look at that. And People get, you know, you can't do that because you're, you're a sinner because you did that. Moses killed a man and got, look what God used him for. Aaron builds a calf and gets all the nation of Israel worshiping that calf as God that brought him out. And look, look how God used him. Now, I'm not saying go and sin and, and, and go serve the Lord, but don't let your sin stop you. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you sins. Battle that sin, because you're going to battle sin, but don't let that be a hindrance to you. Now, there's certain things in a ministry you can't do, but there are other ministries you can do. And there's no mention, that the Lord therefore has performed his word that he has spoken, for I am risen up in the room of David, my father. You remember who Solomon's mother was? That's Bathsheba. No mention and set on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Look at that. There's a promise that God gave. 
Now, is that a promise I can name and claim? God promised you right there to go build a house of the Lord. That's not a promise to me. They're not all promises are to you. There are promises that the Bible says, study to show thyself approved on the, on the God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, but rightly divine the word of truth. There's nowhere in the Bible today in the church age for you to go build an ark. Is to go out missionaries. In it have I put the ark. We just read that in chapter 5. Where is the covenant of the Lord that he made that he made with the children of Israel? That's all history. That's all the book of Exodus. Reminding the children. And he stood, okay, now here we go. He stood before the altar. That's the brazen altar. Of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. And spread forth his hand. So he's in the temple courtyard. He's looking at the people. And he puts his hand straight out. Now the Pentecostals will weave it back and forth. The Pentecostals will make a holy dance out of it. They take something that's right and they twist it to, to, to modify the flesh. There's nothing wrong with raising your hands to the Lord. But don't do it for your flesh to get excited. Don't do it so people can say, oh, look, look what they're doing. You want to raise your hands to the Lord? There it is. There's a scripture right there. But don't do it for the flesh. Don't do it for the flesh. For Solomon had made a brazen scaffold, and that's the only place that word shows up, scaffold. And you see them on side of buildings. I don't know what it looks like. Some kind of system. Five cubits long, five cubits broad, and three cubits high. It would have been seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by four and a half feet. It's some kind of platform that he would be above the people. Some pastors have that platform in the church, but their big, fat, uh, hollow, hot head, hot air head, you know, they're above their pulpit. They float above all the people, and that's called uh, Nic Nicolaitism. God hates that. They're above the people. He, he wants the people to see them. Again, it's not, oh, look at Solomon. It's so I can have to hear me what I have to say to you. If I below you, my voice is not going to travel around. It's going to get caught amongst the bodies. It's going to get caught amongst the clothes. It's going to get caught among the collar. My voice is not going to travel. So when somebody comes up to me, why are you so loud? Why are you guys screaming and hollering? So the people can hear. That's not Bible. <laughs> yes, it is. Along with all the women lepers that Jesus healed. Inside joke. And set it in the midst of the court. I don't know if that's the center of the doorway or is he between the brazen altar and the labor? I would assume the doorway, the gate. And upon it he stood and kneeled. That's the first time that word shows up. Down upon his knees before all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. So he's kneeling. He, he's standing with his hand, arms up and he drops to his knees. And said, this is what prayer, we're going to look up to verse 21. Because this is a long prayer. O Lord God of Israel. You can't have a God of a Gentile. The God of the Bible is the God of Israel. You can't have a people who's against the children of Israel. Because God is the God of the children of Israel. You know what's wrong with the KKK? Amongst among the things, they are against the children of Israel. You know what's wrong against some of the black people? They're for the black people, not for the Jewish people. You know what's wrong with the United Nations? They're for every people but the Jewish people. You cannot have a Catholic Italian God. That's not going to save your soul. Jesus came unto his own Jewish and his own received them none. There is no God like thee in, a, in the heaven. From a man's going to fall down and worship gods and goddesses. And build all kinds of monuments, temples, and groves. 
Don't think you're so on fire for God today that you're never going to fail and drop. Nor in earth, which keepeth covenant. It's a faithful God. And showeth mercy unto his servants. It's a wonderful God. And walk before thee with all their hearts. It's a faithful, wonderful God that we have. Thou which has kept with thy servant David, my father, that which thou hast promised him. So there are some things that God promised David. There are some things that God promised David's seed. They are not our seed. They are not our promise. And spake it with thy mouth, the mouth of God, and has fulfilled it with thy hand, as it is this day. There's the temple. It's built. That's what he's talking about. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father that which thou hast promised him. I thought David was dead. Remember Jesus was talking to one that I believe uh, the Pharisees or the, uh, the scribes, they don't believe in death and angels and all. He said, did not God said, I am the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, I'm the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. David's still living, though his body is dead. He's sleeping in, in Abraham's bosom right now, at the time Solomon writes. There is, even the Old Testament, there is life after death. The rich man went into hell, and Lazarus went into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom, that rest, they're sleeping, Samuel said. Why did you discomfort me? In hell, they're in torments and pains and suffering and sorrows. And then when Christ comes, he delivered those that were in Abraham's bosom, paradise. And those that are saved today, they're absent from the body. Okay, you put the body in a grave, but they're in heaven, in glory, their soul praising and wondering to God. So David's still alive, it's not his body. Which thou hast promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit upon the throne of Israel. Now, aren't you glad that that's not a period? Because if that was a period, then Solomon would be a liar. Because there is no one today sitting on the throne of David. There isn't. Yet so that thy children take heed to their way and walk in my, thy law. That's the problem. That's the explanation why there's no one on the throne today. Because they did not heed to God's law. That's why there was a virgin birth. That's why you need the sinless Christ was not born of a man's seed, but born of the woman's seed, Genesis 3.15, that will sit one day on David's throne. And once he sits on David's throne in Jerusalem in the millennia, that's it. Forever he's going to be on that throne. He will be the king of kings and lord of lords. Right now there's a gap. There's nobody. It's reserved for Jesus Christ. But we have a little time of. Not yet. And then we're going to have a time of Jacob's trouble. Where Jacob the children of Israel are going to be punished by God their father. For not obeying and doing what they're supposed to do. Then he'll put that king. That king will come on the white horse, as all movies and stories will have. He will come with the throne. He will come with the crown. He will come with the sword. He'll get rid of the enemies. He'll take his, his the, the woman to save her, Israel. That woman that sat with the, left, with the 12 stars upon the moon, which is not Mary, and bring her into the land. But right now, they're in their sin. They rejected the Messiah. Uh, as thou hast walked before me. Now then, O Lord God of Israel, let thy word be verified by signs and wonders. Jews require a sign. Which thou hast spoken unto thy servant David. Isn't it enough that that temple has been built? Yet we need your word verified. So if I were to see God, that's not good enough. In Exodus 19 and 20, all the Jewish people, Moses, Aaron, and all of them saw God. Aaron builds that, that cow. The children of Israel, well, let's go back to Egypt. How dare you kill our people, Moses? Moses gets upset all the time. I've had people tell me, if you show me God, no, you're not going to get right. You're not going to do better. You are a sinner. Adam and Eve saw God 
in innocency and without sin with sinlessness they had god in the garden with them god would come down and say hey i'm going to go visit my creation hi adam how you doing and yet they still rebelled against the word of god it's not seeing god it's not seeing the building it's your faith and belief upon what god has said today believe on the lord jesus christ and thou shalt be saved well let me see him that's not no it's not that way We'll see him one day, saved or lost. But will God in very deep dwell with men on earth? Omnipresence. Psalms 139, 7 and 8. Yes, God is here too, and God's in heaven, and God's in the trees, and God's in the ocean. But that's not the God we worship. Job says, go talk to the animals. You want to learn about God? Go speak to the animals. Get yourself a bird feeder, a bird bath, and watch them. My son used to spend hours and hours just watching ants. I don't know what he. Job says, "Look to the animals; they'll tell you." Behold, heaven and the heavens of heavens. The three heavens, not seven. Cannot contain thee. How much less this house? which I have built. I built this house for you to dwell in, God. Problem. What's the problem, Solomon? You dwell everywhere. You're omnipresent. That means you're everywhere all the time. So, if you are in a room in your house doing something you're supposed to be doing, God is there. If you are in a room in your house with the door closed, you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, God is there. Behold the eyes of the Lord in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God has been and is where Hubble will never go. We sent those probes to Mars. God has been there before man's ever been there. God made it all. God has not only has a presence within all occupied time of, of the heavens, heaven, heaven, and heavens, but God has the occupation of omnipresence through all time. When there was no time, the time present, and the time future. That's the omnipresence of God that made, well, I think it was that woman, somebody else questioned me, Saturday, or oh, religion, all right, with that guy. My, don't have a religion. My Savior is alive from the grave and seated at the right hand of the Father. Your, whoever you are, is still dead in the ground. That's a religion. My God has been everywhere, is everywhere, going to be everywhere. Time and place and presence. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant. I'm praying right now, God, respect me. Wow, isn't it? God, respect me. Because his prayer is not about him. It's about the children of Israel that are before him. He's not praying, God, kill our enemies. He's not praying, God, give me everything. God, give me all their lands. He's praying, Lord God, it's, and we're going to get, Lord willing, the next day, we're going to get into all the people when they get into trouble. And when they get in trouble, his prayer is going to be, Lord God, if they repent and get right and turn to you, Lord, will you accept them back? That's the respect. God asked him, he said, give me, ask anything, I'll give it to you. He said, I want to know how to judge these people. I want the wisdom how to deal with these people. I don't want long life. I don't want money. I don't want riches. I don't want the life of my enemies. I want to know what to do with your people. And the respect here is, I want to know about the people. That's the one thing that Solomon had before he got married to all these women. He cared for the people of God. Then he got corrupt. Have respect, therefore, to the prayer of thy servant and to his supplications. O Lord, my God. You know what Solomon is saying? The God I'm praying to is my God. To hearken unto the cry and the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee. That thy eyes may be open upon this house day and night. Upon the place where thou hast said that thou wouldst put thy name there. To hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth toward this place. Now he says, Lord, open your eyes. Is it quite possible way the, the common Jewish person 
the people of God of Abraham, Isaac, today, and Jacob. Is it possible that God's eyes are closed to them today? Yes. Now, he's still going to protect them as a nation. They still get benefits of God, but a Jewish person of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, if they die today without the Messiah, Jesus Christ, they go off into a devil's hell forever. Now, there is protection in the nation of Israel. If God would shut his eyes and close his eyes tight and not look upon Israel like he did upon Jesus Christ on the cross, Israel would have been wiped off the map. Everybody would have destroyed because everybody has destroyed them. God kept his eyes on Adolf Hitler and said, okay, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. That's enough. You're dead. Americans go in there and bomb them. And the devil sent the Japanese and we got took care of them. And then when, when you get Babylon, they're coming here. All right, all right, all right. Yep, go ahead. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. That's it. You had enough, Belshazzar. Tonight your kingdom is numbered. Then he says in Kings, they are for the Jews. God has never shut his eyes blind to the Jewish people, but he will shut them to the party. You need correction. Now, there are nations that God shut their eyes. He says, Sodom and Gomorrah, you're done. Nope, you're done. That's it. You're done. You're done. There are nations today. They've gone against the Jew, and they will go against the Jew, and Jesus will come back. He said, you're going against the Jews. You are a goat nation. I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats, and the goats will go into an awful place that burneth forever. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. I never knew you. And what are they doing? They're not helping that Jew. God said of that Jew, I will curse them that curse you, and I will bless them that bless you. That thou wouldst put thy name there to hearken unto the prayer which thy servant prayeth towards this place. Look at all the times he's mentioned prayer. Hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant and thy people Israel, which thou shalt, which they shall make toward this place. All right, prayers are brought to this place. Daniel will open his window and, and would face toward Jerusalem. That's what God told him to do. That's what God told the Jew. When you get somebody praying towards Mecca, they pray towards the Vatican. They pray, you know, toward... God never said that today to anybody. You are stealing the rights of the Jewish people. When you have a priest class in your church, you are stealing from Israel. Because the only priest class in the Bible that are mentioned that have different outfits or to pray to a certain place pray a certain way have a building that is to be honored is the jewish people not the church age and not this time of, of the church age the gentiles that are lost when you promote your building as a church no matter what denomination you are you may say oh we love the jews and curse be those that don't love the jews you are stealing from the jews yourself you find me one place where Jesus, James, Peter, John, and Barnabas, and all them, and Silas, and Titus, and Philemon. You find me one place in the Bible where they lifted up a church building. You asked me one time where, where they showed the thermometer for a church building. There's not there. You show me one time where they invited the lost people into the church. It's not there. The Jews are told to pray to a place until they receive Christ as their Savior. Then they can pray anywhere. Toward this place, hearken therefore unto the supplications of thy servant and thy people Israel, which they shall make toward this place, not Mecca, hear thou from the dwelling place, heaven. So when you pray towards the temple I just built, that's not where you live. <laughs> You live in heaven. Dwelling place. That's, that's heaven. Even from heaven. So isn't that kind of weird? Pray to this building. That's, that's not where God is. And when thou hearest, forgive. And he's a merciful, forgiving God. Don't steal the blessings of Israel by 
Oh, we got to pray to a certain place. We got to pray a certain way. We got to pray a certain how. We got to pray new and as all. No, you can pray any way, anywhere, anyhow. What do you do if you're in a dark dungeon as many Christians have been in? And it's completely dark. You don't even know what direction anything is. You don't have no compass. And if you kneel down on the ground, you're going to be in mush and mire and gook. Maybe rats. Christians have been like that. And we're going to look for if we're going to stop there. We're going to look at Solomon when he continues to pray about the persecution the Jews will get because of sin.